Hi everybody and welcome to Insights. My name is Kevin McGarvey. I am a professor of humanities here at Cumberland County College. And one of the great things about hosting Insights each week is I get to interview some people that are doing some very notable, important things. Uh, people that don't get a lot of recognition, they're certainly not doing it for the recognition. Uh, today my guests are Don Forcinito, and he is uh, the coordinator of the ESL program here at the college, and also Joshua Austin, who runs our writing uh, center. We'll talk to him in the second segment. But again, my first guest is uh, Don Forcinito. He is the coordinator of ESL, that stands for English as a Second Language, and he is also an associate professor of humanities at the college. Don, thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here. You grew up here. You were born here. You went to school here. You graduated from Vineland High. You're a real local boy. That's correct. Yeah. Born and raised in Vineland. Uh, I won't say exactly how many years ago, but uh, born and raised in Vineland. Um, had a wonderful upbringing. Uh, great family. Very supportive family. Uh, working class family. And um, I graduated uh, from high school a number of years ago. Uh, and. Um, I took some time uh, for myself. I worked uh, worked in a factory for a while. I worked as a carpenter's helper. I worked in various stores, uh, but found my way to the uh, jewel of Cumberland County, uh, Cumberland County College, and um, I enrolled and attended and kept up with it. Um, had some challenges along the way. Uh, I lost my parents uh, along the way while I was attending school, uh, but I think that just gave me uh, uh, more energy to stick with it and to stay with it. And uh, I had some very great professors while I was here as well. Professor Gibbs, uh, Professor Kewish, Professor Adair uh, really helped me along the way. Professor do still, Johnson. Do you still call them professor now that you're their colleague? <laughs> that was the most difficult thing when I started working here, uh, to, to stop calling them professor. Uh, they basically had to threaten me and say, stop calling me professor. Right. We're colleagues now. So right. that, was, that, was, that was a difficult uh, transition for me. But, but no, I don't call them professor anymore. But so, you, so you grew up in Vineland. Um, we won't mention any specific numbers, but in the 70s and early 80s. And um, Vineland was quite a, a, a different place. You were telling me before that uh, yes. you used to actually go cruising on the avenue. And I've heard a whole lot about that, but uh, you actually did that. We actually did that, yeah. We, we had so much fun. This is, this is back in the early to mid 80s, I guess you could say. That's, uh -huh. uh, we, we used to uh, get together at friends' houses and uh, uh, we, we would choose whoever's car we wanted to go for a ride in and then we would just uh, go off to the avenue and we'd cruise back and forth. Right. Uh, we'd turn around, there used to be a circle right at Delcy Drive and Landis Avenue, we'd, we'd go around that circle and then we'd come back and go all the way back to East Avenue and turn around and, and do it again. And do it again. And it was just fun. You'd pull up next to somebody you knew and you'd talk and you'd laugh. You'd stop and talk on the side of the uh, right. of Landis Avenue, get something to eat. But it was it was fun, innocent fun times. There's a lot of people that, that miss that. There's a lot of people I hear about that all the time and, and they miss that. They miss the, the yeah. innocence of those days. It's true. But, um, but you came here to Cumberland and as you said, you had uh, some people that are still here. You had uh, Professor Adair, uh, Professor Kewish, you said, yes. Professor John Gibbs, yeah. uh, Professor Walter Johnson. He retired a couple of years ago, but mm -hmm. certainly doing well and thriving. Yes. Um, did you ever see yourself as a professor here at CCC when you were a student? You know, years ago, I used to have an image in my mind of a of smoking a pipe and walking around campus and just being a typical the professor. <laughs> yes, exactly. The right. <laughs> It changed a little bit, but um, I, I don't know if in my wildest dreams I ever would have pictured that. Um, it's, it's such a fantastic experience to be here and to be a professor. I mean, it's an honor. It really is truly an honor, and I mean that in every sense of the word, to, 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 to help make a difference the way those professors made a difference mm -hmm. for me, to, to help people to, to, to achieve their goal. I just uh, about a half an hour ago, I, I ran into our new president, Eve, Eve Solomon Fernandez, mm -hmm. and she was showing some people around the campus, and it's a, a beautiful day today. And oh, yes. You're right. It's just a, it's a, it's a wonderful place to, to work. Uh, I think it's probably a wonderful place to be if you're a student. Um, it is. Uh, a lot of the students uh, that, that I speak with, they tell me how beautiful the campus is and the beautiful flowers, right. uh, the landscaping, the, the, you know, the easy access for, uh, to the buildings, right. and uh, just how beautiful everything is and how welcoming and accessible everything is. And I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a wonderful place to come to every day for, for work. Well, you married um, a girl whose parents were from Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. correct? Correct, Marisol. yes. Mm -hmm. And um, you have how many kids? Two children. You have two. I, my daughter, Isabella, and my son, Nicholas. Okay. Yes. So you're the ESL coordinator. You work with um, Latino students 
students from all over the world, most, uh, but mostly la la Latino students every day. Correct. And uh, you're married to a, a Puerto Rican girl. How does that affect your family dynamics? What's 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 your your home life like? Well, um, I, all all the elements of a, of a normal home life, I would I would expect. Uh, we, um, I I I would imagine that. Uh, being married to someone, uh, 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 to my wife Marisol, has really helped me perhaps to get a, a, an insight into uh, in, into being multicultural. That's, um, that's what I'm, I'm wondering. Mm -hmm. yeah. My family, uh, predominantly Italian American, so I know my history of my family. But uh, my wife's history is also very, uh, very amazing history of uh, how hard her parents worked and all the struggles that they had to face to come to to come to the United States and working hard and working many hours. And I see that in a number of the students that I work with. Um, many of them work over 50 hours a week. Uh, they work in the day. They have shift work at night. Uh, that's why a lot of our courses, most of our courses are offered in the evening to, to accommodate their, their busy schedules. But it did give me an insight as to just how people in our county and in, in the country struggle just to, to, to make ends meet uh, and, and um, you know, the, the challenges that they had to face along the way. Um, yeah, but it's been uh, it's 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 been an, uh, an enlightening to to have that experience and to use it with the students. Right. So it's been it's been quite a journey. You never really saw yourself here when you were a student at CCC. I'm I'm sure you enjoyed it. You were you were challenged mm -hmm. by it. Uh, the people we mentioned before, they're they're terrific instructors. Yes, so, and they, they they taught you well. Um, the ESL program itself, I, I want to make sure that I understand and I want our viewers to understand exactly what the ESL program is, mm -hmm. uh, how they can get involved in it, uh, the different le levels or layers sure. of it. Can you just give us a, a, a sort of a brief background? Sure. The, the ESL program, English as a Second Language program here at the college, is uh, primarily it's a developmental level program, a pre-college preparation uh, level program. Uh, students whose first language is something other than English attend the program. We have four levels of instruction. Uh, each level is uh, progressively moves progressively closer to college instruction and at the culmination of the program students would let enter me, let college. Let me interrupt you for one second. You say you have four different levels. Mm -hmm. All right, so I would imagine that the, the first level is for students that are really just learning right. uh, the rudiments of, 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 of the language. Correct, like a high beginner level. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then do you, and do you have the same instructors for the various levels as well? We have a, a variety of instructors uh, who teach at the different levels. I teach a number of the courses um, and we have several instructors who teach at the different levels, but they're qualified to teach at any of the, any of the four levels. Uh, each level we have a, a reading and writing course and we have a listening and speaking course as well. And no, the Go back and describe that the reading and writing course. How does, mm -hmm. uh, if, if I um, I've been in this country for two years, let's say, and I've been working on my, most of the English that I know is really from, you know, television and talking to friends. Right. Uh, it would, would this be the appropriate program for me? It would be, because uh, we have students in our program who want to attend college sitting right next to students who just want to learn a little bit more English uh, along the way for their uh, personal benefit or for work-related uh, reasons. But uh, in our reading and writing courses, for instance, the, the focus is on uh, reading comprehension and being able to write coherent sentences using grammar uh, structures that are appropriate for College, uh, college preparation. So mm -hmm. uh, students, they'll take the courses uh, en route to uh, working their way towards college, but again, they'll, they'll take courses just for their own benefit as well. And then the listening and speaking courses, uh, we have students working in role play activities where they're assuming different uh, uh, roles and personas in the activities while using English. Uh, we'll have them uh, such work as a Such as a job interview or? or uh, yeah, it could be a job interview or uh, speaking in a, uh, where, uh, you know, something that's academically re related, like uh, making a, a speech, where we'll have students work on their uh, pre doing presentations. Even in the level one course, the students get up in front of the class and, and do a presentation. It must be thrilling and terrifying for them at the same time. All at time. the same time, exactly right. Yes, if you think it's thrilling and terrifying just at the college level, imagine you know your second language is English and you're learning English. Sure. You, 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 know, you may know every third word or so. And so right. it's, it's a challenge. But actually, that, that leads me into the philosophy of ESL which is uh, we don't 
we don't want to rely as much on translation. Of course, we do. There is some translation involved, but really, uh, the philosophy is to have students immersed in English, to hear English as much as possible, to hear the rhythm of the language, to be able to to uh, to to find their own voice within the language, so that they're not relying as much on translation. They can interpret the language and uh, have their response in the same language without relying as much on translation. Of course, as they get higher in the levels, that becomes uh, a bit easier for them. Uh, in the beginning, it's it's a challenge, but I tell students, uh, you know, as long as you persevere, uh, you you rely on the support services that we have available, mm -hmm. you're going to be successful. Um, is is immersion still the the philosophy? I know that you know the whole idea of uh, I had I had Professor Gibbs on on the show recently, and he mm -hmm. was talking about a, a French teacher he had in high school. I think it was in Trenton, mm -hmm. and he said they weren't allowed to speak a word of English in the class, mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah. I'm wondering, is that still well, philosophy or? In college, I had a, a course in German that was the same way. It was a summer course, two back-to-back -back summer courses in German. <laughs> we weren't allowed to speak English in class. It was, uh, well, it was highly encouraged that we focus on our German, and so we became German uh, speakers when we were in the class, which mm -hmm. I have to say, it was scary and it was very intense, but it did help because our professor would speak he would speak German throughout the class. I mean, he'd, he'd smatter in some English here and there to help us out, right. but it was primarily German. And um, we did, a after a certain point, we did start to get the cadence and the rhythm of the language. And we started to feel comfortable f with, with the way we would respond. Mm -hmm. And uh, we kept that separate from our English, which was, which was important. Uh, I guess students really learn the language by, r they, they learn the, the, uh, the written word first, don't they? I know when I, I, I spend a lot of time in Mexico, I can sit and read a Mexican newspaper and understand about three quarters of it or so. Mm -hmm. But I really can't hold my own in a, in, a, in a conversation. I have to go very, very slowly. Well, the first, the first steps in learning a language would be, of course, uh, hearing someone speak or, or, or encountering the language in, in the written word. Uh, because what you do is you're, you're processing, you're taking the information in. So uh, I wouldn't say that that's easier, but that usually comes first. But the synthesis of creating the language, whether it's speaking or writing that comes afterwards so that's a that's a, uh, a step in the process that comes a little bit later you have to understand the language first and be able to process it before you're able to to I utter see. it and produce it yourself right. where do most of, of your students come from I, I know that they're predominantly um, Latin but then mm -hmm. to break that down are most from Puerto Rico um, most of our students yes are, are uh, of Hispanic origin uh, I would say probably over three-quarters of our students are from uh, Hispanic speaking Hispanic countries, Hispanic speaking countries. Uh, South America, most of our students uh, from the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, um, and, and various places. I've Mexico, had an, we had a number of, of Turkish students re recently and from the Ukraine. I yeah. Those as well. Yes, our other, I'd say 20 to 25 percent, we have a number of students from Turkey, uh, Ukrainian, Russian students as well. And uh, each semester we'll get a, a student or two from, from various other countries, other language groups. Uh, let me ask you one more question. We have about 30 seconds or so. What's the most fulfilling part of the job for you? What do you think? Uh, it, it has to be just learning so much about other cultures, uh, the multicultural. You're learning from them? Oh, yes. I, 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 I don't know if I'm learning more from them than they are from us. I'm not really sure. Right. I, I like, to, like to think that it's an equal, equal sharing there. But just, just the, the appreciation of multiculturalism and just to understand uh, you know, wh where, where everyone else is coming from in the world. We're not alone in the world in the United States. Thanks very much for being here. It's great, it's great that you're here. Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Stick around for uh, Joshua Austin. Hi, I'm Larry Kane in the Cumberland Mall. All the best to everybody at Cumberland County Community College. Your success begins there. Hi, everybody, and thank you for sticking around for the second half of Insights. My name is Kevin McGarvey. My guest uh, for the second half of the show is Mr. Joshua Austin. He is the Developmental Education Support Coordinator at Cumberland County College, and he is also the coordinator of the college's writing lab, and he's one of the most interesting people uh, that I know. He <laughs> truly is. Uh, Josh, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. It's really great to be here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, you have a, a really interesting background. Uh, I do. We don't know each other 
to you know all that well but i know that you were home educated yes and you were home educated by your mom for the most part right yes yes uh, in cumberland county yes greenwich in greenwich tell us that story what okay um well i went to kindergarten for one year i did do two years of preschool before that uh -huh. and on track to continue on with um with um, next, the next year at, in Bridgeton school system because I was living at Bridgeton at that time. Right. Um, and then my mom and dad decided to home educate me and we were one of the earliest families, I think, in the area to do that. They were pioneers of, of sorts, but their primary reason for home educating us, I think, was to develop character. Um, they wanted to spend more time with us. It wasn't so much to, to isolate us. Um, but they just enjoyed being with us and, and wanted to teach us themselves. So it was, it was a great experience, how loved do you, it. How do, you, and yeah, how do you look back on it now? Do you have any regrets at all about it or was it a... Initially, I think I missed my classmates, yeah. um, but I, I love my brothers. Um, I have two younger brothers, Nathaniel and Seth, and I enjoyed being with them, spending lots of time with them, and we fought, as any brothers do. Yeah. But um, and. I enjoyed the pace of home education too. I, I think I learned some some degree of self discipline during that time. Um, and you read a whole lot. I did read quite a bit. That was one of my favorite things to do. You're a very well rounded person. You you've traveled a lot. You have uh, you have what I think is great tastes uh, in literature. So I think they I think they did a, a, a terrific job. Thank you. With you, you can also trace your family back. I think uh, a long long time, right? Yes, um, especially my Greenwich roots, um, more, more so on my mother's side. Um, they were tea burners. Um, they were colonial, colonialists, and um, they, they dressed up as Indians and um, burned tea in Greenwich. Their names were on the monument. Um, so I grew up in that little town, rode my bike past that monument, went to the store, got penny candy, uh, swam in the bay, all those sorts of things. And yet when you were a teenager, you really never dreamed that you would end up here or no or did you you were traveling around the world and going to england did you ever well think you'd end up i, I didn't like i didn't really travel much as as a kid i was i was fairly isolated stayed in stayed in greenwich most of the time mm -hmm. um we didn't go on a lot of vacations um working class family but greenwich had just about everything that i needed i got a i got a job at a young age 14 years old started cutting asparagus um uh, family also of dairy farmers and um, you know people that work the land so there's something about that good for the soul I think to do that hard labor to sweat um, so that was something that I was really a good experience as a young person later I worked as a well driller um, well I didn't drill wells but I, I assisted I had a shovel and yeah. scooped a lot of sand um, and then so you came to CCC I did I did how old were you when you came here I, I was 18 years old um, but I had been to CCC before that. My, my mother actually was pregnant with me um, in 1977, spring oh, of 1977. Yes. She had Mr. Gibbs. She did, English she 102. Gibbs. And I remember stepping into my first English 101 class with Mr. Gibbs, 8 o'clock in the morning. He threw down his briefcase on the, on the table and uh, looked at us sternly. And when he started speaking, there was something familiar about his voice. Um, but I, I love the man. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're good friends. Um, for the people that, that don't know, uh, Mr. Gibbs, along with uh, Professor Adair, yes. we're celebrating 50 years of their uh, gracing us here at Cumberland College. A treasure, both 50, of them. 50 years, 50 years, just, just amazing. Um, so you went to CCC, you graduated from here, you went to Stockton, Yes. you ended up in England. How did you, how'd you end up there? Um, well, I, I had to take a few years to kind of discover who I was. Oh, to find I traveled. Yourself. Yes, I did. I did some of yes. that myself. Yeah. Um, great, great times. Go? Traveling mainly in the U.S. at that time by car. That's the best way to see the United States. Right. Um, ended up in uh, Faulkner's hometown, Oxford, Mississippi. Well, we talked about that too. That's one thing we have in common as well. That very macabre going to these writers yes birthplaces and graves yes. and and houses where they grew up but as much as i love new jersey and appreciate the the beauty that's here in the landscape um i i was amazed at grand canyon um wyoming i think is probably my most favorite state outside of my home state mm. 
um, California, the diversity mm -hmm. um, of, of the landscape and the people and the different food and culture. It was, it was fantastic. Sleeping in Walmart parking lots. Mm -hmm. um, we threw the maps on the windows and just um, just camped out. It was it was right. an awesome experience. Right. I like the story you told me last week about going to Oxford, Mississippi, <laughs> and visiting yeah, uh, Faulkner's. What was it? Hit the gravesite or the house? The house. The house. Unfortunately, Roanoke wasn't open at the time. We we knocked on the door and peeked in the windows, but I did get to walk around the town and saw the statue of the Confederate soldier mm -hmm. in in the town square and. Um, so that's that's the weird stuff that I that I love to do too. Um, I lived in Massachusetts. I used to go to Lowell to track down Jack Kerouac's, <laughs> you know, gravestone. Yeah. And Oscar Wilde in Paris. So you know, travel just to just to find something like that. I, I did find myself in England though. I am I am a bit of an Anglophile, so love all things English. Um, went there first as um, a student for an EF trip, mm -hmm. um, literary landscapes of England and then went back with a friend to help uh, her move in and um, that was a different experience. I was, I was by myself a lot of the time because she was getting ready to start university there so I, I saw a, a, uh, a London show completely by myself, mm -hmm. um, walked around the town at night and um, just realized that this is something that I'd like to get more of. So when, it, when I thought seriously about graduate school a few years later, England was my first choice. And that's how I ended up at University of Essex. After teaching at Cumberland, developmental classes for a few years, I realized I needed to go to graduate school and England was the only choice. Mm -hmm. So um, being, being there again for, for the year, newly married, I was nine months married, mm -hmm. um, started my master's course. My wife, a few weeks in, also did a master's degree. She was, she was bored, that's wanted great. to work, and right. she decided that she would study as well, started attending classes with me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you had to make a career choice too. You said that you, you weren't sure if you wanted to be a jazz guitarist, yes, or do something in yes. the field of literature, both yes. of which are such high-paying <laughs> jobs. But both a kind of up, communication. You ended though. up doing both, I think. I, right? I did. I still I still play, although not so much jazz. Oh, I've heard you play. Anymore. You're terrific. Yeah, thank you. Um, but. I think I made the the right choice. Um, it's it's a Cumberland County College is a fantastic place to work. Mm -hmm. Great people. Um, I, I enjoy all my classes, both online classes mm -hmm. and traditional classes. Well, we'll talk about the the uh, the writing lab in a couple of minutes. Sure. But I, but I want to ask you this: You teach 101 and 102 I as do. well, and English 101 is one of those classes that nearly every student that comes to the college pretty much has to take. Yeah. It is the touchstone course. It is the one that you, you can't escape English 101. Uh, 102, it's called <laughs> English Composition, as 101 is, but it's an intro to literature class. Right. Do you enjoy teaching them both as much? One really primarily is a writing <laughs> class, and one right. primarily is, is comp and lit, intro to lit. There, there are pros and cons to each. This semester I'm teaching English 101 again and I haven't taught English 101 in a number of years, maybe three years. So it's great to be back with those students that are brand new in the fall semester. The excitement, the enthusiasm. Um, I remember teaching 101 a few years ago. I had my students do 13 essays a semester. It was crazy. 13? I have four kids, Kevin. I can't, I can't, ha I can't read 13 essays anymore. Um, not not 25 times. Right. So they're doing six essays this semester. Class discussion is probably the best part of English 101. It sure is, isn't it? You can you can talk about just about anything, right. um, and relate it to the rhetorical patterns. And students are engaged. They're right. interested. And as long as it's a safe environment where students can discuss, um, you know, I'm having fun. They're having fun, and we're right. both learning together. I feel I feel reborn. I'm teaching 101 as well, and I have oh, really? a really big 101 class this semester. I think there was a mistake. I have 31 students <laughs> in my 101 class, and the discussions have been tremendous. You know, yeah. we're reading. People are volunteering to read their works, and we're critiquing each other, and we're doing it in a very respectful, you know, safe way. And yeah. it's just it's a really fulfilling experience. I can tell for the students, and it is for me as well. Uh, 102 teaching literature. You do that as well. That, that is one of my favorite courses. I think it is my favorite course to teach here. Um, just exposing them, I get to hand pick right. the, the stories, right. the poems, right. um, the plays. And we like a lot of the same writers too, we, and we teach we a lot do. of the same writers. We do. 
Um, so I have a lot of enthusiasm when it comes to the subject matter and students. Students sense that and sometimes they get the bug. Right. And um, it's more difficult, I think, to write about literature, but reading it right. is just pure pleasure. What could be a better job than coming into, coming into a beautiful place like this every day and talking about Langston Hughes and reading Hughes's right. poetry and, you know. And Hughes is so approachable. Too. Mm -hmm. That's that's. He, he's a great poet to introduce students to because he's understandable. His messages are are still valid. Yep. Um, just Hughes one day, Maya Angelou the next. Uh, right. You know, Updike, Faulkner. I mean, what a what a what a life we have, right? It's perfect. Yeah. We only have a couple of minutes. Tell us about the writing lab. Okay. Um, I have been working at the Writing Lab the past three years, and the Writing Lab is really a place where students can come to get help with writing issues that they may be having, even if they need clarity on directions. Now, must these students be in an English course? Can it be? Can they come with any the course? For history any course. As long as the course involves writing, um, I help. I've even helped students with PowerPoint presentations, uh, making sure everything is correctly formatted, that sort of, being, that sort of thing. We do um, APA documentation style, MLA, um, help students with a lot of those, check citations, uh, make sure the students are on track. Now the students can just walk in or must they be referred? Um, they don't have to be referred. They can self-refer, they can walk in, although we do get busy. Uh, around this time of year, October, is when we're starting to really pick up. Um, so I suggest that students make an appointment. Probably the best way would be to email me, um, jaustin at cccnj.edu. Yes, okay. and they can make an appointment very easily there. Uh, okay, in the last minute uh, of, of, of the show here, what's the most fulfilling part of the job for you? The most fulfilling part of and the you job? You are a man of uh, a <laughs> lot of seasons there and a lot of, you know, with a lot of different hats. I, I enjoy interacting with my students. Um, I love um, learning from them, um, seeing, seeing the light you know, turn on when they, when they finally get what I'm trying to get across in class. But I'm more of a, I, the, more than the content, I think you know, I, I enjoy being around people yeah. and learning. I'm curious about their lives and their experience, and I get to do that every day. Every day. Make that connection. That's the greatest yes. thing about teaching is when suddenly you can see the light go on and somebody sees the world in a new way, a way they didn't even know existed before. Precisely. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being here. Uh, if people want to go to the writing lab, they can simply email you, yes. Jay Austin, yep. A-U-S-T-I-N, like, like the city in Texas, uh, at cccnj.edu. Yes. Or they can call you at extension. Um, 1350. 1350. So, Josh, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Come back again, okay? I will. Thanks. Our guest has been Joshua Austin, the uh, coordinator of the college's writing center and uh, tremendous professor of English, English 101 and 102 as well. Thank you so much. I'll see you next time on Insights.